U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents as special guest Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, Earhart Fingston, who farms at Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. There is little question that the rural community, both agriculture and business, are in a deep problem. At the last official report that I heard from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, last April, April 1967, the American farmer was receiving 74% of parity. Now, parity to a farmer is about the same as cost of living is to the working man. But 74% of parity was the lowest point that we had reached since the depth of the Depression, since 1934. I don't believe that it takes any economist to be able to understand that there isn't a businessman, a professional man, or anybody in the United States that could pay today's high costs and sell either his production or his services for the same price that he received 20 years ago. Yet the American farmer is not even receiving that much, much less than we received 20 years ago. So we have reached a point where credit has taken over and where the farmers basically are confusing income with credit. We've reached the end of that to a point now where as farmers we've tied up the businessmen's uh, money so that credit is becoming tighter and tighter. We've reached a point where things are going to come to a standstill unless farm prices are immediately restored. But I think the thing that we need to look at is why the farmers are receiving such low prices. What is the problem in rural America today? It's price. Purely and simply price and nothing else but price. And the reason we are receiving those low prices is because the rest of the economy has organized. Our buyers are now national in scope. They're able to bypass any area, any individual, any market, and let us set. So we've reached a point where we cannot hope to get fair prices in the methods that we used, say, 50 or even 100 years ago. The farmer's basic method of selling is to go to the market and say, what'll you give me? Now, I think if you consider just this one statement alone, what will you give me? This is the farmer's way of determining his price. He is asking his customers what they want to pay him for his various production. And we're selling to corporations, and every corporation in this nation, without one single exception, is set up for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to turn a profit. And the very underlying principle in the American profit system is to buy just as cheap as you possibly can, and it's a good principle. So here the farmers walk up to these corporations set up for the sole purpose of making a profit and ask them what they want to give us and then wonder why we don't get a price. Now, in order to bring a little bit fuller understanding to you farmers and the listening audience, let's reverse this. Let's say that the people that you are buying from, your implement dealers, your gasoline dealer, your fertilizer salesman, your feed dealer, let's say all of these people that you do business with were to come out to your farms and ask you what you wanted to pay for their merchandise and then took what you offered you guys would have made some money last year, wouldn't you? And how? In fact, I think you'd have busted everybody that does business with you, perhaps in a single year. So when you stop to consider this hopeless and helpless method of selling, then why should we be so surprised what's happening to us? How could we, under that method, be getting a better price than we are? 
Certainly you don't believe that someone is going to pay you a better price just because you need it. And if you think so, maybe you should take a stock of your own method of thinking or how you think in a particular case. Let's say, for example, in a gas war. I'm sure that you've had gas wars in about all communities. They have them in my area every once in a while. And when they do, they get that 35 cent a gallon gasoline down as cheap sometimes as 18 and 20 cents a gallon. Did any of you ever drive into a filling station when there was a gas war going on? And after the station attendant had filled your tank, did any of you ever tell him, now look, mister, you can't make any money on 20 cent gas. You're going to go broke that way. So better you take 35 cents a gallon out of that bill I just gave you. You didn't do it, did you? Nor did anyone else. In fact, if you'll be real honest with what you were thinking at the time, you were actually hoping that they'd keep right on being fool enough to do it till your tank got empty again so you could hook them once more, didn't you? That's what you really thought. Now, what makes you think than anybody else is going to think any different about you, about your situation. Your buyers are going to continue to buy from you just as cheap as they can, just as long as you let them. So what is it going to take to overcome this situation? What do we as farmers have to do to get fair prices? Well, in the first place, we're going to have to become businessmen. We're going to have to sell our production just exactly the way every other good industry in this nation sells their production. In other words, we're going to have to get into a position where we can put a price tag on it. Let's take the automobile industry, for instance. How do they sell their production? Do they go to their dealers and ask their dealers what they want to pay them for automobiles? I hope to tell you they don't. They establish their own price the price on the basis of what it costs them to produce those automobiles. Then they tell their dealers, this is what you're going to pay me, or you don't get any automobiles. And the American farmer is going to have to get into exactly that same position so that he becomes a businessman in marketing his production rather than a panhandler begging for a price. And in order to do that, it is going to take a national organization of farmers. This is a national problem. It cannot be solved on a local basis. So you can't bring this price up on a local area or in a local market. If you tried to raise the price in just one area only, your buyers would bypass that area, try to get their production from the other areas, let you set. But let's put it another way, too. Let's say that you did succeed 100% of getting a full fair price in this area, but you weren't able to do anything for any of the area anywhere around. The surrounding areas would soon take advantage of your market here. In fact, they'd flood your market here and destroy everything that you had gained. So it's going to take a national organization dealing in all commodities so that you can bring all prices up in relative balance. You can't bring them up commodity by commodity without destroying yourself that way either. Let's take grain, for example. Let's say you brought the price of grain up, but you didn't bring the price of livestock up. I think you would soon find that your livestock producers would be turning to the grain market, selling their grain and destroying, actually, the very market that you had for your grain. But let's say you did it the other way. Let's say that you brought the prices of livestock up, but you left the prices of grain down where they are, that the grain producers were losing money. I think that very soon then your grain producers would start producing livestock and would destroy the industry in that way. So it takes an organization dealing in all commodities, bringing them all up in relative balance to prevent the shift out of one commodity into the other. But it also takes an organization dealing in all commodities to keep all producers working together, to keep from destroying each other, or to try to get well, let's say, off of each other's misfortune. And this has really been the case in the past, where you've had the livestock producers making an effort to drive the grain price down so that they could buy their livestock cheaper, or it happened the same thing in the dairy industry. So it takes an organization dealing in all commodities nationwide 
to keep all prices up in relative balance to take care of all agriculture, not destroying one for the benefit of the other. But it's also going to take an organization that does the entire job. Just the pricing can't be done by itself. We have to be dealing in such a way that we are able to take care of any overproduction that we might have. Now, it is our responsibility as farmers to produce what this nation needs, to get a full fair price for our production, and then insulate whatever is not needed from the market or channel it to secondary markets. Now, in the past, we've let one or two or three percentage of the total production set the price on all of our production because we didn't take care of it ourselves. We let somebody else do it for you, for us. And for this, I'd like to take an example, show you exactly what did happen. Now, of course, since the feed grain program, we've had no overproduction in feed grain. In fact, we have not produced what this nation needed. We've had to dip into the reserves and dip into them deeply. But for 11 years straight ahead of the feed grain program, we did have overproduction in corn. We had an overproduction of a little bit less than 3% on the average for those 11 years. But we didn't do anything about it. We let it be used to destroy all of our price or let that 2 or 3% set the price on the entire production. We actually paid more to keep it in storage here in this nation than the entire uh, commodity was worth. Now, had we operated under the NFO programs or under a surplus disposal setup and the price incentive which we have in our programs to help regulate this amount and had insulated that 3% from the market, it would have had a terrific advantage. When this started, our average price in the state of Iowa, the nation's leading corn producing state, was about $1.62 a bushel. Yet after 11 years disregarding a 3% overproduction, our corn price was down to about 90%, 90 cents a bushel. We had lost way over 30% of our price or 33% of our price to 3% overproduction. Now, had we been operating under the program, either insulated that 3% from the market or seen to it that it was moved to the shrunken bellies of hungry people elsewhere in the world, even if we had given it away and had maintained the other 30% of our price, we would ha be half again as well off as we are today. Now, in our program also, we have the price incentive factor to keep from destroying our prices or to keep the supply in balance. In livestock, it is not the number of livestock that produce too much meat. It is what that livestock weighs that produces that tonnage. In 1955-56 period, for example, our hog prices dropped from an earlier 27.50 price per hundred weight down to 10 and a half. And we were told that the reason for it was that we had produced 10% or 6% too much pork. Now, had we been operating under the NFO program, under the contracts already signed by processors, contracts that go into effect just as soon as enough farmers wake up, join our organization so that we can fulfill these contracts, we'll be able to use the price incentive. In other words, we'll be able to place an incentive price on a weight either low enough or high enough to produce the proper amount that's needed for this nation. In that year, for example, if we had been using the NFO program, we could have placed an incentive weight on a lighter weight. That year, the average weight of those hogs was 235 pounds. Had we placed an incentive price on 200-pound hogs high enough that a 200-pound hog would have brought more money than a 235-pound hog, our farmers would have sold them. So actually, had that been accomplished, it would have brought about a difference of about 17% in supply. In other words, with exactly the same number of hogs, we could have created an 11% shortage. Now, organized, you can do these things. Unorganized, there isn't a thing in the world that you can do about it. But I also believe that any organization that ever does this job for the farmers is going to have to use one other tool. They're going to have to use the power of the farmers to bargain with. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this, 
Since our August 16th meeting, when we had 35,000 NFO members in a meeting in Des Moines, collective bargaining has become accepted by the farmers. In fact, one farm magazine took a poll indicating that 82% of the farmers now believe that collective bargaining is their only solution. So as a result, other groups have started talking about collective bargaining, but are talking more or less in just bargaining and not using a holding action. In other words, they say they'll just bargain and get contracts that way. Well, my opinion, that is about as foolish a notion as anybody can have, that he's going to bargain without using the production or without being able to cut it off. But let's say for the moment that I am an agent representing such an organization that's going to bargain without a holding action. Let's say that I'm dealing with you now, you're the processor. So I come up to you and I say, now look, mister, the farmers are going to have to have better prices for their production. And we've arrived at this figure here to give us the price that we need to stay in business. Now, you're either going to pay that price or else. Or else what? Or else I'll let you have it at the same price you want to, that you've been paying or whatever you want to pay. What else can I do without cutting it off? So this is the one basic thing that farmers are going to have to realize in connection with collective bargaining for agriculture, that you have to have a means of cutting that production off. Until you are in that position, you have nothing. There is no bargaining without using the power that they have. Just exactly as labor could not get a price increase or could not bargain if they did not use a strike. Just exactly as the teachers were not able to get their increase for years until last fall, they took a strike. And when they went into an organized effort, it didn't take them two weeks till they had the price increase or the wage increase that they needed. So the farmers are just kidding themselves if they think that they're going to keep on doing exactly what they have been doing without making any change and changing the situation. As long as you intend to do what you've been doing in the past, you've got to expect to keep on getting done to you what's been done to you in the past. In other words, you've got to figure on taking a good rooking and ever, ever lower prices. So there is no bargaining without using a holding action. The NFO has this method in their setup, and this is no different than what every businessman in the United States uses every day to enforce his price. There is no merchant in the United States that could operate his business if he let his customers set the price. So what we're proposing in NFO is to do just exactly what every merchant, every professional man does every day. We set a price on our production, a price based on what it costs us to produce. We offer that production to every processor in the United States. Any processor that's willing to pay that price and contract for it, he gets it. It's that simple. Now, if they refuse to pay us a fair price, we can do no different than the merchant is doing. If you go into a grocery store, you don't like that merchant's price, you're either going to pay it or failing to do so, you don't get those groceries. It holds good in the clothing store, in the implement store, hardware store, anything you want to name. They put a price on the product and then you pay it or you don't get the product. Now this is the program of the NFO, to put the farmer in exactly the same position that every other good business and professional man has been in in, in years. But you can't do it as an individual. You have to do it as an organized group. Now, we're offering the farmers the opportunity to solve their problem, to solve the problem of rural America, and in my opinion, the problem of the entire economy of this nation. It's based on the raw materials of the nation. The agricultural products and the minerals serve as the deposit in a checking count. You, account. you cannot keep putting one dollar in and take out four. You have to keep on putting in as much as you take out. And the raw materials are the only new wealth that the nation has. Without them, when they're being exploited, the entire economy has to go down. Now, we're giving the farmers that opportunity to solve their problem. The NFO is the only organization set up for this purpose, and this is our only purpose, to solve the farm problem. 
We're not going in business of any kind. We're not eliminating the processors, the handlers. It is part of our membership agreement that we do not go into business. Our purpose and only purpose is to organize the farmers into a collective bargaining group to get a full fair price for their production. At the same time, we're a nonpartisan group, I think as is evidenced by our convention in Louisville, Kentucky. Vice President Humphrey was a speaker on one evening. He's a Democrat. The evening preceding that, we had the Honorable Senator Milton Young, one of the outstanding farm senators, a Republican, speaking at our meetings. So I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It makes no difference to me. The purpose of our organization is to get a full, fair price for our production and do it in a business-like manner, exactly like all other industries in this nation have done it for years. Now, there's no conflict here between our organization and any other farm group, processing group, co-op, or whatever you might have. We believe that those other groups or organizations have served a valuable purpose. They weren't set up to do what we're doing. So I'm not condemning them in any way for not getting our farmers a price. This was not the purpose of their original setup. Their purpose was to give farmers services in other lines. They've done that. They've done it well. But there was a complete vacuum here in rural America. There was no way to get a price for the farmers. So this is why we built the NFO, the collective bargaining organization, to do the one job and only one job, getting the farmers a full fair price. So let me repeat, there is no conflict here. There can't be any conflict with any other group that wants farmers to have a fair price. So we are not urging any uh, farmer to leave his present organization or de to desert it. If you believe that that organization is functioning and giving you the service it was intended for, which I think they are, then you keep right on being a member of that organization and taking advantage of the services that they give. But let me point out that you cannot exist merely on discounts in insurance or by dividends returned to you from handling and so forth. You have to have a price and you have nowhere else to go. There is no other organization but the NFO set up to do this purpose or to perform this function. I think the recent decision by the Supreme Court on the Sunkist case has very clearly brought this out, that it does take an organization of producers and producers only. And this is what the NFO is. There is no, no one can get into our organization unless that he is a producer. So we have all along seen to it that we are organized under the legal structure provided for us by the Kaprovolstead Act. This is an act that Congress gave us in 1922. Senator Capper from Kansas and Volstead from Minnesota had the foresight to give the farmers this right to bargain. It is the broadest act that farmers could possibly have. We hear a lot of talk about that we have to have a Wagner Act. The Capra Volstead Act is the Wagner Act for agriculture. We've been told we have to have a labor relations board in agriculture or an agricultural board to do the bargaining. In labor, the labor relations board can't do anything without that powerful organization behind it. The teachers had access to the labor relations board. What good did it do them? My daughter is a teacher. She suffered under those low wages and terrible conditions that teachers been operating under for years. But until they were organized, they, they kept right on taking that low price. So this is the only way that the farmers are going to solve their problem, is through organization. And it must be an organization as ours is, an organization of producers only, an organization in which the producers themselves make all the final decisions. I don't want to ever get into the position again where I have to depend on my price by politics or by government or by the, any other group that's going to di dictate or direct prices to me. I want to be in a position where I, as a farmer, have the right to establish my own price and my method of getting those prices. Anytime that the farmers hope to let somebody else do it for them, they can hope 
or rather not hope, but be assured that it will be done to them, not for them. This is our past history. We had good farm programs when we had 30% of the population out there. We had political power then, but this is a thing of the past. We're down to less than 6% of the voting population anymore, and the other 94% believes that it's to their interest to have us producing for nothing. And I don't want to get into that position ever again where any other group sets my price for me. We've operated under that long enough. This is why we're down where we are. But at the same time, don't overlook the farm programs that you have. We're now in a holding action. We're giving the farmers the opportunity to solve the problem. So take advantage of these government programs that you have. There is no reason why farmers should sell one single bushel of soybeans. You have the opportunity to seal them, to get the government loan, so that you can rest assured that you can hold those beans for 19 months. You have already been assured by the Department of Agriculture that you'll be able to put next year's crop under loan. You have been assured by the Department of Agriculture that all grains that are sealed right now can be resealed next summer. I'm talking about the 1967 crops. So there's no reason why any farmer should sell. What collective bargaining means, farmers working together, bargaining together, selling together. You now have the opportunity to do so. And the only reason farmers will be taking lower prices in the future from now on is if there are enough farmers who are willing to take those lower prices. Once the farmers say, this is what you're going to pay, that's it. It's over with. There's no choice but to pay that price. It'll be no different than buying an automobile, than buying a suit of clothes, than buying anything else. The producer sets the price and you'll either pay it or you don't get it. When the farmer gets guts and backbone enough to stand on his own two feet and run his business like a businessman, he can hope to have the same consideration that other businesses have. But until then, he has to be expect to remain a beggar in the market. You have the opportunity. The NFO is giving it to you. So we urge all farmers to join us, to cooperate in this effort because this is an absolute necessity. I also urge every businessman in rural America, you know what the situation is out there. Your welfare is at stake here. You can't ring up money in your cash register that your customers never receive. Neither can the money that they never get paid you be used to pay off any bills. We have to have farm prices, and through the action of the NFO, we are now able, in a position, to get a full fair price for the production that we already have to put a profit on last year's production. Let's do it. U.S. Farm Report has presented Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, Earhart Fingston. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.